That is the theme for the rat vendor, which means it is time for double feature. Wow, just keeping that strong. My name is Eric, and Michael is here to tell us what today's spooky films are. <laughs> today's uh, today's films are uh, Suspiria and Vampires. So two titles that rarely do you ever hear without the director's name attached. Yeah, well, we uh, we know and love some Dario Argento. Uh, what's this vampires thing about? It's John Carpenter's vampires. Oh well, John Carpenter. Who saw that coming? <laughs> um, I, I've I've thought for a very long time that uh, John Carpenter is the American Dario Argento. Oh, interesting. Uh, when it comes to when it comes to things like pacing and camp versus uh, sure, just sure. general technique, yeah, I think that there are so many similarities there. And I really don't know if we did a good job of picking the right John Carpenter film to <laughs> illustrate that. Yeah, you're right. If you put this uh, up with, well, the other 50 of them, we did. Sure. Um, also wanted to talk about our Kickstarter. It's over. It's over. It's over, but we're recording this in the past. Yeah, as so I mentioned we, we don't would know. do last show. We know it's over. We don't know what happened. Yeah. Yeah, it's not actually over for us right now, and I still feel nauseous. <laughs> this kind of reminds me, so we're coming back, this big Kickstarter thing happened, we're doing a show now. Doesn't it sort of remind you of that season at South Park where you didn't find out who Cartman's father is? Um, and then everybody comes back, That remember the two-parter, sure. who's yeah. Cartman's oh, yeah. father? And they come back, yeah. they come back to the Terrence and Philip yeah. episode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, uh, it reminds me of that a little bit. And if you'll remember, there was drastic fallout sure. when people tuned in and didn't get the answer they wanted. It also kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, Community, where season three ended, and then uh, everybody was so pumped for season four, and then uh, they came back and everybody was bummed. Yeah, don't don't talk to me about Community. Talk to me about <laughs> Suspiria. Oh, wait, there's spoilers and chapters. I don't even think I mentioned that last week. I don't think you did. Uh, see, this is what I'm talking about. Distraught. I'm Distraught. Off my, off my fucking game. Uh, the spoilers are... Well, we don't need to talk about spoilers and chapters. Everyone knows. Don't listen to the movie with the films, the scene, the movie, and then chapter over the <laughs> something. All right, Suspiria. <laughs> Dario Argento is an Italian director who basically created the giallo genre. You got giallo right, and you mispronounced genre. How do you feel about I'm that? I'm sorry. Those two words are too similar. We've done an exhaustive amount of Dario Argento on Double Feature. We did- um, You say next to the John Carpenter film? <laughs> <laughs> We've done opera- We've done uh, Deep Phenomena. Red. Oh, Phenomena. Deep Red was another one. Yeah. Um, and and somehow ignored possibly the most famous one, would you say? Yeah, sure. Well, that's that's double feature MO. We kind of skipped <laughs> the one that everybody's talked about for a while. Oh, God, but I don't know. How do you skip Suspiria? Well, you got to wait for the remake to be announced. Sometimes I see a movie and just, fuck, man, you feel like a satisfied customer. Oh, you know my God. I mean? Suspiria is... So I paid for the movie experience, and now I'm getting it. There is no secret as to why Suspiria is the one people go to. Yeah, it's right. not just awesomely violent. It's not just legitimately scary. It's not just gorgeous to look at, but it also has that score. Oh, it certainly does, doesn't it? <laughs> Man, I think you just did the whole show in one sentence. <laughs> It opens and it's fucking raining hard and Susie gets off a plane. It feels like she's seeing the world for the first time, but we just started the movie, so we're seeing it for the first time. <laughs> we're already watching the movie with a friend because Susie doesn't know what the fuck's sure. going on, doesn't know what's going to happen. We're just as excited about ballet as she is. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, I don't know about that one, but um, Susie is Chicago-born uh, Jessica Harper, who looks like a prototypical Dario Argento oh, yeah. lead. Yep. Uh, Phenomena and Jennifer Connelly, I mean, they could be sisters. Mm -hmm. But Argento has this thing that he kind of forged out for all these movies that would follow of the powerless girl. Yeah. Became really a staple of 
everything that uh, that these movies inspired. And, you know, I think Powerless Girl, that's how I kind of feel about the characters thinking about them, but are they totally powerless? Don't they kind of become empowered in all? The, I mean, think back for me. Are they becoming oh, yeah. empowered in all the films? Is that, I, it's, can it's, we check them all off? I don't know about empowered or helped by animals. Um, I'm not sure which oh, one. No. I don't know if being led by a fly and ahabbed by a monkey counts yeah. as empowerment. All right. All right. Um, no, I think you're. I think you're by a monkey. You're gonna bring that back up. Huh? <laughs> I think uh, in a serious fight. I don't think we could talk for weeks after that. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. I think um, that's probably what resonates so deeply with me for Dario Argento is that his films kind of begin with an ingenue woman and you get this i don't want to call it coming of age because they're adults it's not about them reaching a level of independence the way that kind of coming of age films tend to be instead it's about uh them discovering how much they can take yeah sure and how little they're willing to take right yeah um and I think Suspiria is the beginning of that and the, probably the strongest version. Oh, man. Of Deep that. Red is totally that, too. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of that in Deep Red. Well, and let me hit your other points of excellence on this film. The visuals. I don't think I yeah. can fucking talk about the cinematography enough oh or do the, you want, uh, the lighting. Do you get weird feelings so you want to lick the screen when they're <laughs> uh, showing the interior of the dance halls? Well, so the interior of the dance halls. The interior of the house. Yeah. Um, the exteriors. Of, I mean, start with the interior. We have this completely red uh, inside of this building. The spatial relationships and the opening attack scene and uh, the hanging there. A lot of weird playing with space throughout the whole movie. Um, the slow moving zooms and the tracking. Everything's very, very deliberate. Yeah. What other people see in The Shining, I think I see in Suspiria. <laughs> yeah, agreed. But man, when I think about, okay, so I, I'm not just going to gloss over the term spatial relationships like anyone should know what the fuck I was talking about. <laughs> think about an exterior shot. When we think about space in movies like this, uh, the history of horror films are littered with claustrophobia. It's something I've been thinking about a lot lately. These, uh, the kind of relationships that's horror films have with being trapped, being enclosed, feeling like you can't get away, uh, the idea of being frozen in a dream. I don't think you can talk about space in this movie without immediately considering the scene with the piano player and the dog. Right. You know, this must be the most open space ever used in any film of all time. <laughs> right. It's, uh, and it's just pitch black between these two lit government-looking type buildings. He's standing there with his dog alone in a sliver of light. Yeah. And uh, clearly something very bad is about to happen. Where could it come from? Anywhere in the darkness. But it's so open and I don't see anything. And we're building this climax. And then unexpectedly, his own dog attacks him. Mm -hmm. It's just fucking brilliant. That's one of the things with Suspiria that... And I know we we end up doing this a lot on Double Feature where... We watch a movie that's about, say, witches and go, man, witches are awesome. Why don't people do th more things with witches? <laughs> sure. Um, now, this is, of course, coming shortly off uh, having seen Lords of Salem X amount of times. Right, right. But uh, we did it uh, Sleepy Hollow. We did sure. it uh, Headless Horseman's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but seriously, when you think about the breadth of work you can do with with witches as your subject matter i mean it's better than werewolves and it's better than zombies and it's better than vampires because witches are basically your op your 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 rules for witches woman magic yeah right <laughs> well it's great that you can go hey anybody can have a party with witches because you need so little to get involved right but i look at witches and go really you're gonna try and sell me on a movie with witches well i don't you know, know that's you, you and i both really like that movie where tim roth gets fucked by an oven of witches <laughs> it's it's such a bizarre movie uh suspiria for me to be so in love with because i can gush and gush about it and you <laughs> ask me witches. 
And you ask me what it's about, and I go, oh, what's it about? Uh, I don't know, uh, witches or something, but it's great. Yeah. You know, it's just yeah. uh, the the treatment of witches in Suspiria. Mm-hmm. You know, there's that meeting with the psychiatrist, which I think is hilarious. Yeah. They start talking about witches, and she asks, you know, hey, stop for a moment. What What are we actually talking about when we're talking about witches? And the guy basically goes... Oh, God, lady, I don't know. I'm a sane person and a psychiatrist to boot. Uh, why don't you go talk to that crazy old man over there? <laughs> <laughs> it, um, it, he, you know, he attributes the belief in witches to mental disorder. Right. But this is a really telling moment for our show in Dario Argento, because it's the moment where we find out that Argento knows about skepticism. Mm-hmm. He just prefers talking animals. Right. I think Dario Argento might know animals aren't psychic. I think he just has, uh, you know, he thinks it's more fun to pretend he believes in that stuff. Or hypothetically to have a room where you store all your razor wire. Right. God, that's, man, that is the best. Yeah, agreed. That is probably my favorite part of the movie. You know, they play with a little bit of camera stuff, but it's mostly lighting. The camera stuff is the zoom lens uh, that he loves, or the wide angle one's another one. So wide it warps the sides of the mm-hmm. uh, of the frame. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something we've talked about the use of before. But that um, that camera that separates this from you know this feeling of stage that I want to get to. She jumps from a ledge. And pans down and whoops, it's razor wire. Yeah. <laughs> it might be one of the funniest camera tricks I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, as if the camera, oh, that razor wire down there, I didn't, I didn't know that was going to become relevant in the scene. I'm really, uh, really sorry about that, guys. I would have panned out a little bit. But you can't ignore the lighting. I think that's the more, if I'm just going to look at, you know, cinematography type elements or visual elements, space is a big deal and sets and um, camera techniques. But this movie is so much red and blue. Everything is just cast in this lighting that in the scenes where you get normal lighting, it almost looks out of place. You've been staring at red so often. It's something that, I mean, every time we talk about colored lighting, you know it's tacky if you're not careful with it or if you're not just uh, relentless, I guess, with it. I wouldn't even say Suspiri is careful with it. I would say it dominates with it. Yes. It says you're going to fucking like this red lighting. You don't have a choice, but um, I think that's probably part of that unique this is a movie experience that I get when I watch this. There's red gels outside in the rain right from the very beginning. You know, that whole opening sequence, a lot of that is, well, we we'll bring in the lighting right away. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of like we talked about on Glen Gary, Glen Ross, that outside stage lighting. Right. And that starts getting me thinking about, you know, Mamet and plays and what Glenn Gary Glenn Ross was doing. And then you go back inside and the lighting is uh, even harsher. It surrounds and it traps Susie. I think that's when you start to get some of the claustrophobic stuff that she's followed around. You know, there's just a haze of red ominous lighting everywhere. This is a bad fucking place that she has come to. Right. I think the lighting almost seems to break the fourth wall. You know that that scene when their rooms are infested by maggots and they all have to run? They go to sleep in that oh, kind of yes. common I space. Oh, yes. I know that scene. Yes. And they all, you know, they all lay down to go to sleep and, uh, you know, the light is turned off. And when it's lights out, a red light actually comes on, much uh-huh. like in a play where you would switch the different color sure. lights. But it's so much fucking red. It's like they're in there to yeah. fucking develop photos or something. I mean, I can't believe it's, it's blinding. As if they're going to sleep. Yeah. And then Goblin kicks in, and I actually think to myself, this is what I mean by fourth wall breakage. I'm looking at this and going, with all that red light and all this rock music, how are none of the girls going to mention how difficult it's going to be to sleep? You know what I mean? It just seems so out of place. I'm imagining being there with them and going, God, would someone turn off that fucking Goblin and shut off that light, (laughs) and maybe we can actually get to bed here. We've seen Argento make countless movies about the stage. Uh, do you think that interest in the stage, I mean, one, do you see that in Suspiria? And two, do you think maybe that's part of what makes him a distinctive director? I think, yes, you see it in Suspiria. I mean, the film is about dancers. Um, it's right. about people whose job it is to move on stage. I think Suspiria could be just as uh, quickly as a, a play as a movie. 
Sure, absolutely. Well, and and we also we've also seen opera, which again yeah, deals right. with with theater. I think. Don't and, forget Phantom of the Opera, the correct, uh, unspoken right. Argento movie. Absolutely, show. Dario Argento is very deeply involved, at least with his with the grandiosity of the of the characters mm -hmm. and the way they move when things are happening to them less when they interact with each other you get a very kind of solid film sense when two characters are speaking but when you have somebody running around being terrorized by something they are hamming it up yeah sure the window breaks and oh my god is that the end of the world orchestra kicks in everybody's sure. ready to go yeah right we're um, doing a piece and you get these these kind of pointed uh finales to certain scenes um mm -hmm. that the whole thing is kind of building up to and then not only does she fall through the glass but she's hanged right it's just it's these these moments that stand as kind of uh they're little set pieces. They're very sure. much events. Exactly. Every scene in this movie seems like this is the scene where. Right. Exactly. You, know, you could see there. there's really no wasting time between scenes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess there is, but you don't think of the movie that way. Right. You think of him showing up that day to film and going, all right, we're filming the hanging scene. Right. We're filming the oven full of witches scene. Right. Should have done that joke in threes. It would have gone better. <laughs> we're filming the... Uh... 30 seconds where we see a witch and it dies scene. Right. Yeah. End of film. Yeah. <laughs> Not important. Stab the witch. Get out of their house. It's going to explode. <laughs> That's one of the things that, um, that I always kind of remember about Suspiria, aside from the plethora of things we mentioned. <laughs> right. Is that there's barely a witch in that movie. Yeah. The movie kind of goes and they says. They spend as much talking, uh, as much time talking to the psychiatrist as seeing the actual witch. More yeah. so maybe. There's a glowing silhouette of a witch. She uh, gets stabbed. She dies. And good thing we killed the witch. That was a lot easier than I expected. But one of the things that uh, is interesting doing something like an Argento film and having surprise, it's a real witch. Goodbye. <laughs> is that the way the Argento feel goes throughout the entire movie is you're kind of trying to play Scooby Doo. Yeah, well, of course, that's what you do in Argento movies. You're kind of going, who's the witch? Who's the witch? Yeah, which yeah. one's the witch? Which witch is which? And eventually, <laughs> it turns out that there's just a witch. That's yeah. that's who oh, the witch it's is. The witch. I knew it. <laughs> I knew it was that dastardly witch this whole time. <laughs> I knew there was something no good about her. Uh, all right. So, do I talk about Goblin? Do you talk about Goblin? We can't just uh, ignore. You know, I know. Okay. This is the thing. We've covered Goblin extensively in the past. I mm -hmm. won't say too much, mm -hmm. except to say that this is likely their most famous work. This, If I, I can't say that of Dario Argento, I think it's safe to say of Goblin. Sure. Well, I think I, I think I kind of went into it when we first discussed Goblin, but the first time I heard this song was independently of both Suspiria and knowing who the hell Goblin was. You saw this as a cover, if I remember correctly. It was, yeah, the Smashing Pumpkins opened with it the first time they toured after they had broken up. Ah, uh, sure. It was their first U.S. tour, and the first thing that happened was this song played. Sure. And if you don't know what the hell you're listening to, Eric, yeah. it is it is the most exciting, terrifying, nerve wracking bit of music. How el whenever in history have you oh, I can't think what the instrument is. Didgeridoo? Yes. Yeah, I'm here for you. It's the first time in history that you will hear a didgeridoo invoke <laughs> so many different emotions that you end up just glued to whatever the hell else is going on well yeah you have to see if there's going to be some kind of if you're going to get it if you're yeah if yeah. there's going to be some sort of explanation somehow in a mostly <laughs> instrumental piece it's uh god damn it's haunting but it's also repetitious and a little silly in that yeah. great argento way yeah where it's kind of funny but that's just because you don't want to admit that you're afraid of it you know? Exactly. Sure. And then there's the distorted growling lyrics that I love. <laughs> it's uh, the sound. The lyrics might as well be woo spooky. I mean, that's <laughs> right. I mean, that's basically what's happening. And then the use in the movie, it just cranks at full volume. Every so time good. the music comes in, it just it's won't let up. So good. 
if you were ever interested in what makes a film scary, you want to have a, uh, a very pointed examination of that. Find a spot to see Suspiria in a theater and sit in that fucking theater where you can't turn down Goblin with your TV remote when yeah. it kicks in from complete <laughs> silence. I have to watch this movie with my hand writing on the remote for fear that I'll get kicked out of my uh, complex here. It's, but that, I mean, that's part of where the fun comes from, too. Oh, yeah. Is every time the music kicks in and I kind of grin and, you know, embarrassed in front of whoever I'm watching it with, going up, oh, sorry, I know it's really loud. I know the music's <laughs> goofy. Why is there, it's so loud here. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Oh great! So you're gonna you're gonna give me an ending of haha, kind of silly. Sorry about that. And then we have to talk about vampires. Uh, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Do we talk about vampires? What's the fucking title of this movie? What is this, this movie called? the The movie is a, is I guess called Vampires, but I've never heard it called anything but John Carpenter's Vampires. You can't call it Vampires until we started doing it for the show, right? And then I saw. The John Carpenter aficionado is mentioning it, not in, in shorthand, the way we might call it uh, Rocky Horror or Requiem or Trick R. Right. I don't, maybe, <laughs> maybe you don't call it that. Um, but just, oh yeah, Vampires from 1998. You've never seen, that's a good game to play if you want to yeah. be a fucking film snob. You know the, uh, the film Vampires, 1998's Vampires? No, you yeah. know. From... I bet there were a hundred movies called Vampires every year since 1960. No, 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 Michael. The, the James Wood uh, flick, Vampires. Oh, right. The, uh, yeah. Do you know uh -huh. the one <laughs> with I'm... The Baldwin, uh, with the Baldwin brother. Mark Boone Jr. is in it. Vampires, you ever heard of this? <laughs> <laughs> I think we used to see Mark Boone Jr. all the time in uh, Chris Nolan films. Yeah, uh, he gets the variation on what I'm continuously calling the Ichi split. Yeah, in uh, in these <laughs> movies. But yeah, all right. So I want to credit John Carpenter right away, not just yeah. because I'm going to call it John Carpenter's Vampires, and that's probably I'm going to write the uh, show title, assuming I'm not uh, too busy killing myself to <laughs> put this episode on the internet. But after making fun of John Carpenter's scores uh -huh. for the last 10 films. Yeah. And we always do this thing where we go, well, we make fun of them, but they're actually really, really good. Yeah. We make fun of his simple use of uh, one Casio uh, keyboard, uh -huh. what MSI would call my sweet Casio. Right. And now we get the score to Vampires, and it's got fucking drums and twangy guitar, and it's rocking out. I think he's, uh, I think he's trying something a little different. Yeah, Vampires is firmly in the John Carpenter uh, 90s era. We have drawn very heavily from John Carpenter's uh, 80s, um, 80s stuff. And then we did Escape from L.A., which I guess technically counts as 90s, but it's a version of an 80s movie. John Carpenter got pretty in your face. Yeah, sure. Come the 90s. And Vampires is a really good example of that. And it's not just with the score. We, we have talked a lot about Escape from New York and how it kind of has this, this air of being totally awesome. And oh my God, that movie is <laughs> so action packed. But it's a John Carpenter movie. Sure, and, sure. Every, you know, it's not, it's not that. Well, and that's great too to see Escape from LA because Escape from LA really was that. Right. He was exactly. making the movie that everybody talks about the first one. As right. it is. Um, and Vampires is just that so deeply. But we, we also talk on the show about how vampires are terrible subject matter for films. Yeah. We've done a lot of films and we always come on the show and go, this is the one good vampire movie. <laughs> right. Uh, Let the Right One In is the one good vampire movie. From Dust Till Dawn is the one good vampire movie. I'm told 30 Days of Night is the one good vampire movie. There's a lot of interesting stuff in 30 Days of Night. Um, you like that? That was a useful piece of information for yeah. literally no one. But let me tell you something that John Carpenter's Vampires does that no other movie in history has ever done with vampires. You're about to say the words vampire SWAT team. No, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's part of it, though. It's I mean, that's kind of the the whole package. There is what vampires is is if Anne Rice came to America and got her ass kicked by <laughs> American justice. I think you're going to have to elaborate a little bit on that. We have 
Valak as as our um oh what's the Anne Rice vampire? What's his name? Lestat. Yes. We have Valak as Lestat in uh in this film. He uh we get this awesome story, and I, I will admit that I do love the origin of Valak and vampires in this film. Sure. Where we get this idea that he was maybe possessed and the possession went terribly wrong. And instead of the demon being driven from the body, the the soul was driven from the body and Valak sure. took full control as a demon and then spread his evil seed all around Germany. Sure. Um, but and that's so, so Anne Rice to me, this this dark gothic tale of of a of a trapped soul who's been, you know, whose soul's been killed and now he's just a demon and we get it's it's way back in time and you get the whole it's germany and it's gothic and it's dark right so we start with the typical Anne rice sexy vampire universe you see valak right he's got the long hair and the fair skin and the chiseled looks and the trench coat sure yeah let's shoot him with machine guns (laughs) right bring that motherfucker to america bring him to the southwest that's what this movie does is John Carpenter goes, yeah, I know vampires. Let's kick their ass. <laughs> right. I was amazed um, how much the movie would have to uh, lie to convince people that at its heart, it's not assault from precinct 13. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? sure. It's trying to make a vampire SWAT team slash dusty <laughs> road film, but it's really it's escape from New York with rules it's got it's got the arbitrary rules element <laughs> right yeah you know yeah, that's important yeah or i guess maybe more accurately to say it's really escape from la yeah but um, it's also got the from dust till dawn magic right and oddly the the desert rapey captivity part sure not as much the vampire part although i guess that's there yeah well it's got the from dust till dawn idea of yeah we're gonna kick some kick some ass that's what i love about from dust till sure, dawn is sure. that is that yeah this is vampires we all know vampires sure and that that has that element but instead of them being these horrific terrifying monsters they're the Anne rice sexy vampires yeah um and then we get that speech the james woods speech in the yeah. car sure um i don't know if you i don't know if you know about vampires and i don't know if you don't believe in vampires but listen, they're not all sexy and they're going to seduce you. You want to sure. try garlic? You're going to get <laughs> you're gonna... right. Oh, my God. It's just so fucking funny to me. Well, because we've seen that with vampire movies, you have to deliver your mythos, right? Yeah, right. So we have dens. That's something we're going with. Right. We have a telepathic link to the master. Right. We have a master. Yeah. Also, that um, that kind of plot device of she sees what he sees. Right. Which I I had to rack my brain for this. I don't know if you'll be able to confirm this for me. That was was that the third Wishmaster? The yes, seeing well, yes. that was Wishmaster, right? Mm-hmm. And the fourth one was the super serious. Uh, the fourth one, the fourth one was the one about a f- mature themes, a failed marriage with a genie in it. Right. Thank you. Yeah. I tried to <laughs> man. I tried to give the Wishmaster series a bunch of credit just now, and you just <laughs> blew the cover right off of that. Yeah, one of the uh, and the rules and one of the unwritten rules is tons of ass kicking, I guess, mm-hmm. that right. the vampires are going to, yeah, I mean, decimates an entire team in a single scene. Yeah, it's so good. And honestly, what is less than a single scene? I think the film hits its quota for transitions Yeah, in that uh, <laughs> it's composed entirely of the the whole film's worth of cross dissolves <laughs> is I'm going to come in and. I don't know, a couple people die here, a couple people die there. I, this scene's really not that interesting, and I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> he's bored with all the ass that he's kicking. It's true. Which gets back to that John Carpenter can't help himself, right? He's right. like, I'm going to kick ass, I'm going to... Oh, but what about all my characters? So well, I better just cross-dissolve my way through this scene. Sure. Well, that's... Gotta that's... get back to all the character building. And and that's one of the other things that I really like about this film is is even if the characters from a from a writing standpoint are flawed i don't mean flawed characters i mean you know (laughs) from the drawing board maybe they're not the most fleshed out characters john carpenter knows who these people are at least (laughs) two-dimensionally 
we have uh, we have James Woods character who is a vampire hunter till the end. Hates vampires. Thinks they're gross. Also, he's kind of vul- they're gross. He thinks uh, he, he's really vulgar. He talks a lot about um, getting wood. Yep. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to leave a little dead <laughs> silence right there. And then we get uh, we get um, the Baldwin, his partner. Settle down, everyone. Daniel Baldwin. Right. I got so excited. I was like, how did Alec Baldwin get so large and less attractive? <laughs> Daniel Baldwin. Daniel Baldwin's character is great because he moves in this weird arc that um, most shitty films get really easily, but John Carpenter can't quite get his head around because he's this badass guy, but he's also the partner. He's the little John to Robin Hood. Uh-huh. But he's also a hopeless romantic, I guess. And throughout the course of the film, falls in love with a character who we solely see heavily breathing in a car. That is, yeah, for the entirety of the movie. I'm gonna call that the uh, that would be the rapey part of From Dust yeah. Till Dawn. <laughs> I had to take all your clothes off and tie you to this bed. It was right. really the only <laughs> option I could see. And all the characters, and we have Valak, who is just this devil, and we have the Padre, and then his evil his evil pope boss who is the new pope and he gets to come in and be all ha, 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 slow clap yeah and while the characters are flawed and they're two-dimensional i love them so much i love that i don't have to wonder what their motivations are <laughs> i love that i don't have to go oh man i wonder how the priest is gonna take it, it i mean right, i right. i love just knowing james woods will be the ultimate badass and it's it's basically a badass roster. Who will be more badass? Uh, and the reason I love that is because they start trying to one up each other until you get this this it's a domino effect of climax where it begins with the cross mm-hmm. and and he's tied to the cross and he's going to be part of this completion of a ritual that will make it so that Valet can walk in the sunlight. Sure. And immediately Padre steps up, shoots the Pope. Right. And right. we have we have badass marker number one. Oh, don't worry. Here comes Daniel Baldwin in a drive by crossbowing to, <laughs> right. pull, to pull the cross down. And well, we're thinking- you, you missed the part uh, puts the gun to his head. Right. Yeah. Basically uh, makes the move for self-sacrifice and is immediately taken down. Right. In a second. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, what if I just uh, light this guy's nuts on fire? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that gun to the face. Let me just. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. It's true. Um, but then we know that we know that James Woods has to be the ultimate badass. So he impales Valak. With the very ceremonial cross that Valak has been searching for his whole life. Uh And then uses his body to bring (laughs) a building down. Sure. And set Valak on fire. And then Valak explodes. In fireworks, right? I mean, that's we get uh, vampires that shoot fireworks when they die. Right. Of all all the vampire films we've ever covered, that we've ever called the best vampire film. Uh Uh-huh. Of everything you've seen, really, from... Here to Fright Night. Sure. What would you say is your favorite kind of vampire death? Um, because that is something that varies widely from these movies. It's true. Right? It's true. Just as much as the what does garlic do? Um, does uh, the death of the homeless guy from Hellraiser count as a vampire death? I don't, I don't remember that. Um, I think it's very similar to the one in Fright Night. I think Fright Night still takes the cake for me, but this is close. I like I like the eruption of fire that happens in John Carpenter's vampires, but nothing quite beats exploding into a flying animal that then explodes. Oh, <laughs> oh right. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, you know, I went through, um, I think it was maybe last year on the show, I don't remember, but at some point around one of our Whedon movies, I got super into Buffy. And I think... This is how bad my memory is, but I think Buffy is the series that has the insta deaths, where yeah. essentially you stab someone and they just turn into dust. I love that too. Which is kind of like the beheading thing we talked about, where the horror is in how immediate and yeah, final. There's just no yeah. no long goodbye. It's just oh, <laughs> fuck, I got stabbed and then poof, dust. 
Yeah, I do remember that. I I like that a lot too. I think that that vampires is so absorbed in the manliness that it takes to destroy vampires. It's I mean it there's no secret. This is a little bit misogynistic throughout the film. <laughs> a little bit, really. What uh <laughs> what tipped you off there? Um that was a dick joke, so you know. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. When um, all else fails, end your movie on a dick joke. Yeah. Imagine if we lived in that world for just a moment where fade to black wasn't the classic ending, but end on a dick joke was the old <laughs> uh, old adage. That if that were the case, I think they'd probably make what I would guess ballpark five scary movies in that universe. Man, <laughs> that's just a free exercise I've given people when they're <laughs> uh, when they're bored. Reimagine classic films ending on a dick joke. Actually, that sounds like a good use of double feature show at gmail dot com. Yeah, <laughs> send on a dick joke. Um, isn't that how Sinus and Kane ends? <sighs> so okay, so. Basically, the big point that I want to make about John Carpenter's vampires before I let you rebut or maybe tell me that you're you're a little bit further along on it than you were before. I like that John Carpenter took a blatantly American approach to a classical version of vampires because we've gotten from Dust Till Dawn, which is an American approach to American vampires, and we've gotten uh we've gotten um interview with a vampire which is the you know the the classical approach to classical vampires right and the blending that we've seen is only in something like let the right one in which you and i both agree is probably not really a vampire movie also and i know this is unfair it took place far after john carpenter's vampires but we could chalk that up to a swedish vampire film sure if you don't exclude it from uh from the pack for all these other reasons sure but so, yeah, that is a very unique take. We can, you know, we could do that thing uh, we did on the trip and go a British film. So it does those British things. Sure. Yeah, it's a uh, you know one of them Swedish vampire films. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's what I like about John Carpenter's vampires is he goes, okay, this is the most popular version of vampires. They're sexy. They're sleek. They have long hair. They're you know they're they're disarming and they're sparkly. <laughs> uh. America hates that. Let's shoot them with machine guns, even though we know it doesn't work. Right. Just for the, the pure joy of it. <laughs> yeah, the vampire SWAT team, it seems like they would, have, uh, they would have this totally figured out by now. But they bring in the machine guns because it makes them feel good. Sure. It really well, isn't, that, uh, isn't that what it's all about. It seems to keep them at bay at least a little bit. So I don't know. What do you think? Now that now that you've heard my argument for Americanizing Anne Rice's vampires. First of all, I think you could sell me on anything. <laughs> Secondly, Fall Us Fails, uh, wave the American flag behind it. Seems to be a good strategy. <laughs> <laughs> so the website is doublefeatureshow.com and a place to send happy, feel good emails is uh, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. What a fucked up place we're in right now where we have no idea what happened to our show. Yeah, the world is the world is a little bit uh a little we're bit darker. Down here in a bunker and we don't know what's going on up there. We're in our den. So regardless of what happens to the show, we're gonna at least finish out the year. We're finishing which... out year five because why would we stop in the middle of a year? That's stupid. I think we're far past the middle. I think we only have a handful of shows left. That's the middle. So we are gonna do two movies next week. Mm -hmm. And uh, rather than leave the audience hanging, what are the movies? Oh, man. So I'm not I haven't been horrored out yet. I want more horror in my life, Eric. I mean, OK, so we did we did we we've done John Carpenter and we've done we've done uh, uh, Dario Argento plenty of times on double feature. But I don't get the the same kind of gritty, gross vibe that I get when we do something like new French extreme or old school American horror. Oh, sure. Or, you know, something good and red. Yeah. You know, we usually, uh, separate that stuff a lot on our show. Yeah. So I was also thinking, eh, it might be kind of interesting to just, we did some old stuff. Let's do some new stuff. Yeah. So I'm, I'm definitely, I mean, horror recently has been doing a lot of more, you and I always harp on horror for, uh, the genre for, for being ghosty. Or for being sure. 
uh, werewolfy uh-huh. but for doing supernatural stuff that just takes me way out immediately. Mm-hmm. Horror has been kind of kicking against that really hard, except for, I guess, Lords of Salem. Mm-hmm. But uh, The Purge, which is coming out, that's just straight up people killing people. And um, uh, what's the uh, Your Next? Is that what it's called? I haven't seen that. It's a movie about a family that gets killed. Like or it's it's like a new slasher movie. It's supposed to be like the the advent of the old slasher in the new era, right? And then there's um, The Awakening came out a little while back, and um, what was the oh Sinister? I haven't heard of any of these. Uh, well, I, Sinister, I've seen the poster for. I think Sin- that's fairly popular. Sinister, I believe, was uh was had to do with the uh paranormal activity guys sure right but uh for next week i want to do some of those some of those nice sweet spot new violent american horror flicks yeah i'm looking at our year right now and uh, i think it's five episodes until the very end of year five so i mean if we're going to get an opportunity to chuck a few more to have one last good round of Hey, look, there's new things out that you can go see yeah. uh, and, and not be so obsessed with the things that have come before. This might be a good time for that. I'm sure we'll be chucking plenty of, oh my God, there's a David Lynch film we didn't do. Wait, <laughs> Robert Rodriguez still has 17 movies. You right. know, that'll all that'll well, all probably get wedged in. Yeah, the, the worst thing that I think is to come is when we pair Shark Boy and Lava Girl with Mulholland Drive. <laughs> That's, that is the point of inevitability we're approaching. Anyway, so what do you want to do next time? I want to do excision, and I want to pair it with the loved ones. Should we just go into these cold? Should I know anything about these? I know you have talked many a time about not wanting to be spoiled on a single detail, but there is also the option to tantalize people who perhaps have no interest in watching these movies or listening next week (laughs) to kind of coax them into... I mean, you already said naturalistic new horror films. That's enough for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, excision. Excision is definitely not. It's 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 a bad cat episode next week. Let's just put it that way. Oh man, let's just make next week a bad cat episode. A good people can uh, add to that play count. I guess it's been a while since we rolled out the bad cat. All right, let's watch more fucking film. Bye.